Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brighton Council Planning Meeting for May 9th. I'll call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. by recognizing the traditional keepers of this land and specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabek territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. The Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga nations are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. I will also note that the municipality continues to fly the flag of the Ukraine at the municipal center as an expression of the community's solidarity with the Ukrainian people. As part of that solidarity and as a welcoming and inclusive community, I highlight our unwavering support for the Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, and for democratically elected sovereign governments around the world. Brighton, our council and our citizens are deeply concerned about the humanitarian toll the invasion will take on the Ukraine and its citizens. I'll also advise that uh, Councillor LeBlanc is joining us by electronic conference technology or Zoom as we call it. Um, and we'll also be joined by other people participating in the statutory public meeting through that method as well. So Doug, you're pinned on the screen. I've never seen you larger than life, which is hard to believe, I know. <laughs> now we move into the approval of the agenda and it's moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that council approved the May 9th, 2022 planning meeting agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? And if so, please state the general nature thereof. There are none noted. We have no delegations this evening. That brings us to our statutory public meeting. Municipality of Brighton takes steps beyond the requirement of the Planning Act to engage the community in land use planning initiatives. The municipality also holds a statutory public meeting on the planning application and then receives a staff report with a recommendation on which council will make a decision. After council has made our decision, any person or public body may appeal council's decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal, as long as they have made an oral submission at this meeting or provided comments in writing to the clerk's office and requested notice of the decision from the clerk's office. This is also true of any person or public body that wishes to participate in the appeal. For details or information on appealing decisions of council, please visit the municipal website or contact the clerk's office. I have a motion moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Deputy Mayor Connect, that council move into the statutory public meeting May 9th, 2022 at 6.34 p.m. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. We have two items in our statutory public meeting this evening. Uh, one is a consent and zoning, two consents and zoning bylaw amendment, and the other is a um, discussion on a subdivision agreement. The first is consent and rezoning application files B03-2022, B04-2022, Z03-2022, and the applicants are Mike and Lori Van Harlem. Miss, Mrs. Deck. Mrs. Deck, by what method and on what date was notice of this consent and zoning bylaw app amendment applications given? Notice of the consent and zoning bylaw amendment application was sent by first class mail on April 14th, 2022 to all property owners within 120 meters of the subject property. Notice was also circulated to all the agencies as required under the Planning Act. In addition, a signed notice was also posted on the property. Thank you, Mrs. Deck. And would you please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed consent and zoning bylaw amendment? The purpose of consent application file number B03-2022 is to sever the property to create a new residential lot for a single detached dwelling. The proposed severed lands, lot one, will have a lot area of approximately 1.68 acres with a frontage of 45.46 meters on County Road 2. The purpose of consent application file number B04-2022 is to sever the property to create a new residential lot for a single detached dwelling. The proposed severed lands, lot two, will have a lot area of approximately 1.58 acres with a frontage of 45 meters on County Road 2. 
The purpose of zoning bylaw amendment application file number Z03 2022. Could I just interrupt you for a second? Of course. Um, could everyone, I ask everyone coming in by Zoom to please mute yourselves and ensure that you stay muted unless you're called upon, um, with the exception of Councillor LeBlanc, who uh, may need to speak at, at any given time. So um, everyone else, please stay muted. Carry on. Thank you. Thank you. The purpose of zoning bylaw amendment application uh, file number Z03-2022 serves to rezone both the severed lots of B03-2022 and B04-2022 from agricultural exception number two zone to rural residential exception number 54 zone in order to address the reduced lot sizes, associated permit uses, and ensure all structures located within 75 meters of the railway right of way will be built in accordance with the vibration study if required. The retained lands from consent applications file number B03-2022 and B04-2022 will continue to meet or exceed the standards of the agricultural exception number two zone. Consent conditions I and J have been updated with minor wording changes as it appears feasible for the dwellings to be located outside the 75 meter setback area where a vibration study is required to be undertaken. The severed lots will continue to be rezoned to the rural residential exception number 54 zone to ensure if the dwellings are to be located within the 75 meter setback, they will, are built in accordance with the vibration study if required. Thank you, Mrs. Deck. And I'll ask if there are persons present who have questions or comments regarding the proposed consent, consents and zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, we'll start in the public gallery first. Come forward, please. Right, right there. Yep. And there's a, are you going to help her out, Candace? Thanks. Good evening, um, council members and Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Catherine Tran. I am a planner with RFA Planning Consultants and Agent on File. Um, I have reviewed the recommendations from the staff report and I concur with staff's recommendation and I'm here to answer any um, questions any, anyone may have in regards to this application. Thank you, Ms. Tran. Is there anyone else present who wishes to have, who has questions or wishes to make comments regarding tonight's proposed consents and bylaw, uh, zoning bylaw amendments in the gallery? Madam Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us on Zoom for that purpose? Are there any questions or comments regarding the proposed consent and zoning bylaw amendments for members of council? Councillor Rowley. Thank you. Uh, just regarding the um, new wording on the, um, the package that we got just as we came in here regarding the um, vibration study, could I just have that clarified a little bit more, please? I Thank turn you. over to Mrs. Deck for that purpose. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to Councillor Rowley. Um, so originally, uh, we were asking for a vibration study to be included as a condition of consent. However, the proposed dwellings at this current time are located outside of the 75 meter setback. Um, there is a setback permit that will be required to be uh, taken by Northumberland County. And if the chance that that setback permit pushes back those dwellings within that 75 meters, we'd like it to have still in a condition if required that a vibration study would be uh, completed. Uh, that's why the special zoning is, uh, is included, just to ensure at the building permit stage, if it is required, the vibration study will be completed. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Tadman. Just the fact that there seems to be so many conditions, but I do understand why they're there when you're uh, on a county road and, uh, and also, you know, sandwiched between that and the railroad crossings. So um, even though there is a lot of conditions, I, I see that they're necessary here. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. And in other conversations with Mr. Walsh, he's advised me that we'll be seeing more legalese in, in our motions um, as, a, as we attempt to better comply with the Planning Act. So we may see more, we may see these kinds of long consent motions as we move forward as well. Councillor LeBlanc. Yes, uh, your, your chair, your honor. If uh, do these to the planner, if these lots are deep enough, and I see that they're deep, I've walked them. Uh, 
would they conform to a secondary dwelling? And if a second do de secondary dwelling was installed on these lots, would they be um, exempt or would they have to do a vibration study if they're within the 75 meters? Mrs. Deck? Yes, if any um, dwelling, no, sorry. If it, yes, if there is any sort of dwelling within the 75 meters, there would be a vibration study. However, um, we don't allow a secondary home, that dwelling would need to be on top of a garage, for example, and would have to conform to our um, secondary unit policy. You look like you may have a follow-up question, Councillor LeBlanc. Uh, I've seen that look before, that's all. <laughs> it's just that all secondary dwellings have to be on top of a garage. That's the one that got me. Go ahead, Mrs. Deck. Yes, that's what I was clarifying is that they can't have an, a, a second single dwelling home. It has to be conformed to our secondary unit policy, including being on top of a garage. It can't just be a whole other house, a second house on the property is what I was clarifying. It has to be part of the um, original or the primary residential building is what uh, Mrs. Deck is trying to get at, I think. I think to your chair, I don't want to be argumentative, but I think our, um, our bylaw that we passed a lot of secondary dwellings in, this, in the backyard that isn't attached to the main home. And that's where it comes with the percentages of uh, subdivisions where we're allowing up, we're asking for people to have 10% secondary dwellings. Those, those, will, those will be basement units primarily though, Councilor LeBlanc, those, um, in those subdivisions. So it'll be part of the primary build. Uh, Director, do you want to chime in here? Uh, to the Mayor of Council, just uh, the long and short of the answer to that question is yes, uh, the vibration study would be required if there is any residential use within 75 meters of the railway right of way. Does that answer your question, Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, thank you. thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from members of Council? Councillor Rowley. Just one more, thank you. Uh, regarding the shared uh, entrance, so that would be a wider driveway between both properties and that and that's a requirement from the county. Is that what we're saying here? They don't want two entrances there, I, just I, one. I because, imagine that the county prefers not to have more than just, one entrance onto the highway. Okay. Yeah. That's also something new, isn't it? We've had that a couple of times before. County Road 64 comes to mind. 26 so, as well. 26 as well. Okay. You're welcome. Anything further from members of council? Mrs. Deck, do you have any final comments? No, I do not. Does council wish to make a decision this evening? And with that, as Councillor Tadman points out, a very long motion moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Connect, pardon me, that Council receives this staff report regarding consent application B03-2022, B04-2022, and zoning bylaw amendment application Z03-2022 as prepared by the Planning and Development Department. And further, that Council enacts a bylaw to rezone certain lands located in part of lots 27 and 28, concession B being parts one on re registered plan 38R 5049, except part one on registered plan 39R 7578 from agricultural exception number two zone to rural residential exception number 54 zone. And further, that Council grant provisional consent to applications B03 2022 and B04 2022, subject to the following conditions. Each condition shall be fulfilled no later than two years from the date of the mailing of the decision. That application for zoning bylaw amendment Z03 2022 is finally approved. That the application, pardon me, that the applicant shall lay out and dedicate by deed to the County of Northumberland a strip of land ensuring 18.25 meters from the center line of County Road 2 along the frontage of both the new parcel and retained portions for road widening, widening purposes that cash in lieu of parkland in the amount of $1,000 be paid to the municipality of Brighton, that there be one shared entrance at a location agreeable to Northumberland County to access the two proposed severed parcels, that applications for entrance permit for the severed lots are submitted and approved by Northumberland County, 
that a servicing report be completed to determine sufficient quality and quantity of drinking water for the severed lots in accordance with MECP guidelines D54 and D55 to the satisfaction of the municipality of Brighton. That a preliminary grading and drainage plan is submitted to the satisfaction of the municipality, inclusive of any drainage easements if deed required. That a vibration study be completed to identify appropriate measures to mitigate any adverse effects from the vibration from the CNCP railway to the satisfaction of the municipality. That the applicant enters into a development agreement to be registered on title to implement the recommendations from the noise impact study, vibration study, and servicing study. That all taxes on each of the lots be in compliance with municipal requirements prior to issuance of a certificate of official. That a digital copy of a registrable survey for the lots and the appropriate deed transfer be prepared and deposited with the municipal clerk. That geospatial data of the surveyed parcel fabric with respect to the severed and retained lands shall be submitted to the satisfaction of the municipality. And that the owner provides to the municipality a registrable de description on a deed conveying the severed lands for the use of the issuance for use for the issuance of a certificate of official for consent. Mrs. Deck. Uh, there was just condition I and J that did have those red line revisions. I just wanted to make sure those were read correctly. I don't think they were. So with the permission of the mover and seconder, Councillor Rowley, Deputy Mayor Connect, I will now read that if the proposed dwellings are to be located within 75 meters of the CNCP right of way, a vibration study to be completed to identify appropriate measures to mitigate any adverse effects from vibration from the CNCP railway to the satisfaction of the municipality. And Jay will read after the words vibration study, if required in brackets as per the um, revised report that we received this evening. Is that okay with the mover and seconder? Is there any discussion from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Tran. That was easy. <laughs> Move on to the next item in our statutory public meeting, specifically Applewoods Meadows, phase three and four, plan of subdivision. And Mr. Walsh, by what method and on what date was notice of this rezoning application given? Mayor to Council, so the application um, notice was given by first class mail on April 14th, 2022, to all property owners within 120 meters of the subject property. The application was circulated to all appropriate agencies as required on the planning act, and a sign notice was also posted on the property. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Would you please explain the background and purpose regarding this application? There are three total applications, a plan and subdivision application, an application to amend the Brighton official plan, an application to amend the zoning bylaw, and uh, in fact, a fourth application, an application for consent for a lot of addition or technical consent as we refer to it. The uh, plan and subdivision application, sub subdivision application 2021-02, is to develop the subject lands with a residential subdivision containing a combination of single detached, semi-detached townhouse and stacked back-to-back -back townhouse dwellings, as well as limited mixed use buildings with commercial at grade and residential buildings uh, or units or rather above it. The stacked back-to-back -back townhouse dwellings will contain between 10, 16 or 22 units in a low rise townhouse built form. At full build out, the proposed development will contain a total of 35 residential units in phase three and up to 521 residential units in phase four. 
The official plan amendment is to change the designation of a portion of the subject lands from greenfield and environmental protection designations to the residential designation. Technical amendments are also proposed to amend Schedule B of Natural Features, Map 2, right in urban area, to re relocate the permanent water course running north-south across the side and across the site and to remove the wooded area west of Wendell Lane and to amend Schedule C Transportation Schedule, Map 2, of the Brighton Urban Area to add proposed local roads. The zoning bylaw amendment uh, is to establish appropriate zones for the proposed uses as well as establish supportive site development standards. The application proposes to rezone the site from the agricultural one zone to a new site specific residential type two zone or R2-44. Also a new site specific urban residential four exception two or in code R4-2 zone and a new environmental protection zone to reflect to the wetland areas to the west and an open space zone for parkland. The zoning bylaw amendment proposes special provisions in order to accommodate a compact and efficient law fabric and building siting standards. The R2-44 zone in particular would establish more compact site development standards while maintaining the existing range of permitted uses uh, well, whereas the R4-2 zone would permit a new residential use and being the stacked back-to-back -back townhouse dwellings, which we haven't seen before in this Palliate Brighton, uh, and a zone for a mixed commercial residential development. Uh, the consent application B19-2021 is a lot of addition of uh, a few acres from the um, CNR right-of-way, which is surplus lands to the CNR right-of-way and it would be added to the subject lands in phase four for the purposes of est establishing or at least contributing towards the area dedicated to the intended stormwater management pond. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Appreciate the background information. Uh, before I move into the other questions about who would like to speak, I just advise that tonight council is not making a decision on uh, any of this. This is uh, simply to hear comments from the public. Um, staff will bring forward a recommendation at a future meeting, um, and of course, in no small part, we'll take into account uh, comments received this evening, comments received at the public open house, and uh, any um, any written comments that staff receives. And I um, highly, highly recommend that anybody making comment this evening also submit um, in writing your comments to our planning staff. That can be done by email, and I believe the email address is planning at brighton.ca. Thank you. Uh, so I move on to the owner. Does the owner or applicant uh, wish to make a presentation or provide any comments to council this evening? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and through you, good evening, uh, members of council, members of public who are here in person in the gallery and online as well. Uh, thanks for making the time for being here on this beautiful Monday evening. My name is Jennifer Wood. I'm a land use planner with FOTEN Planning and Design. Um, I'm also joined this evening by Cody Oram, who's a civil engineer with Monument, who has been highly involved in some of the more engineering and technical aspects of the project. So he's here as well tonight to help field any questions that are a bit more technical and a little less planning related. Um, so I'll be making a presentation um, that discusses our proposed development and subdivision design, um, some of the background and open house uh, feedback and some updates that we've made to date based on the feedback that we've received through the open house. Um, and through uh, staff's technical review. So there are, as Mr. Walsh said, applications for official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, draft plan of subdivision, and a technical consent for a lot addition. Um, next slide, please. So the area that we're looking at represents phases three and four of the Applewood Meadows plan of subdivision. Um, so this is a, a newly, it's an established and continuing to develop subdivision um, in the west, along the western edge of the Brighton built up area. Next slide, please. 
So this is a little bit uh, closer zoomed in aerial of the subject site. So it's 12.6 hectares in size. It's historically accommodated agricultural uses. Uh, and it has three road frontages currently. So it's got frontage on Main Street. It's also got frontage on Rundle Lane. And it also has frontage on Cortland Way, which is uh, one of the uh, roads being developed currently in, in the earlier phase of Applewood Meadows to the east. There's also uh, to the south CN Rail Line. Um, the subdivision to the east, which you can see it's actually, there's been additional development since this aerial has been taken, but it contains uh, predominantly residential uses, singles, semi-detached and townhouse uh, dwellings, as well nearby um, by the same builder development group, um, a retirement home, which is currently under construction at the southeast corner of uh, uh, Main Street and Rundle Lane, which will also contain has site plan approval for a commercial plaza. And so that's just to the east of, of the uh, Lens RV, which you can also see there just outside of the subject site boundary at the corner of southwest corner of Rundle Lane and Main Street. Um, the area that's subject to the lot addition is outlined in the yellow dashed area. So this was the um, remnant lands that CN no longer needs. There was actually uh, the, the purchase of those lands was actually done a number of years ago, but it's just being formalized now through the Planning Act process to do a, a consent for a lot addition that would just merge that, that remnant block with the subject site. Next slide, please. So just moving in briefly to, to speak to some of the planning policy that informed our planning. Um, this is an excerpt of the Northumberland County official plan. Um, so this is a plan that establishes land use categories and policies to manage growth within the county more broadly. Um, and it really directs the majority of growth and development into the urban areas or what we call settlement areas of the county. Um, there are a number of land use designations, which you can see in the, the legend on the right. This site is within an urban area designation. In the urban area, a range of housing types are encouraged for all levels of income and ages. Um, it also encourages higher population densities as we move towards in, in communities that don't have transit, transit supportive densities and also encourages increased densities in new develop, newly developing areas to maximize the use of planned and existing infrastructure and also to minimize land consumption. Next slide, please. So now moving sort of down, down a tier, we're at the municipal official plan level. This is Brighton's OP land use schedule. Um, so the, the site is has three designations. The first is there's a portion that's residentially designated. That's the phase three portion on the east side of Rundle Lane. That's that light yellow color. Um, and this is really the, the main designation that anticipates residential development. The residential designation encourages, um, you know, achieving certain density targets. targets. However, that density, any, anything that's uh, higher than low density be proposed in a, in a way that there's a gradation in density um, from lower to higher in order to achieve appropriate compatibility and, and separation between higher and lower density residential uses. Um, and the uh, west side of Rundle Lane is for the most part designated greenfield. So that's that kind of lime green color. And the greenfield designation is uh, undeveloped or underdeveloped land within the urban boundary that's intended in the future to be residentially developed, uh, subject to demonstration that there's uh, acceptable servicing capacity. So that's the main difference between the residential and the greenfield designation is residential. It's We know there's capacity. It's slated for residential development. It's earmarked. Greenfield is... We anticipate to, it to be residential in the future, but we need to, through a process, confirm whether there's servicing capacity to support it. And then finally, there's the environmental protection area designation. So that's that darker green ribbon that 
essentially uh, has uh, goes over an existing water course through the property and then it's actually wider because there's an associated buffer or setback from it. Um, and this, uh, this was studied early on by the project team through an environmental impact study, basically to determine whether is this just simply drainage that formed part of agricultural drainage purposes, or is this actually a sensitive natural heritage feature that we need to maintain and protect? And through that study, it was determined that it, it doesn't contain fish habitat um, and is in fact simply uh, drainage. And so uh, prior to any applications being made, we saw approval from the Conservation Authority and Department of Fisheries and Oceans. They reviewed all that have agreed um, and issued approvals to relocate that drainage and it will be essentially uh, piped. It will be piped underground uh, under the Rundle Lane right of way. So it will continue to support uh, the broader watershed movement, um, but it will simply be relocated on this site. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a, an image of the existing zoning bylaw that shows how the site is currently zoned. As Mr. Walsh said, it's, a, it's an agricultural A1 zone currently, uh, which permits, as you can imagine, primarily agricultural uses and generally um, single detached dwelling. And then you can see actually to the to the right or to the east, um, how the lands in phases one and two have been developed and, and zoned. So you have a series of different R or residential zones for the different types of uses, singles, semis, townhouses. Um, and you can see the highway commercial zoning, HC-17 for um, the approved retirement home and commercial plaza. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna try and take you through uh, as efficiently as possible our planning here and what's being proposed and how the plan has evolved because it's been an evolution uh, certainly. So some of the initial objectives of our project team, I just wanted to highlight um, it's, it's not simply a, a lot plan that gets, gets put together. There's some initial uh, objective um, discussions before we, we take it to our urban design team and then the engineers kind of look at it further. Um, the, one of the main objectives was to provide a true mix of housing typologies. We're responding to a, a, a significantly changing housing market. Um, folks who are here and moving to the area um, who have different needs, different incomes. So we really wanted to achieve a real, really good mix of housing types um, that would appeal to different households. Um, we also, especially through early consultation with staff, wanted to explore opportunities for mixed use uh, closer to Main Street. Um, so that's that, those red blocks. Um, so really what we're talking about is neighborhood scale commercial. So, you know, convenience stores, little cafes, maybe a small salon, uh, nothing large floor plates in order to really protect the, the downtown, but to provide opportunities for residents to be able to walk to some of their day-to-day uh, -day commercial needs. Um, another major consideration, which was reviewed very technically, was separation uh, and mitigation impacts from CN Rail to the south. So there was a, a noise and vibration study that informed a lot of the design and the setback of residential uses and the stormwater, stormwater design um, and those aspects. As well, there's um, unevaluated wetland to the west, which was looked at through an EIS, and the setback buffer does encroach onto this property. You can see it coming in in the southwest corner. So that had to be respected and, and not encroached within in terms of development. Um, and I think, and this goes along with the housing mix consideration, was how can this project be part of, um, you know, much bigger efforts that, that are underway to address housing affordability and creating some more attainable housing options. And so we came up with a, a plan here that provides just that, a, a really strong mix of uses. So we've got a mix of single detached dwellings. Those are the lightest yellow sort of 
beigey color lots, more in the middle of the development. So this plan had 44 single detached dwelling lots between phases three and four, 38 semi-detached dwellings. So those are the brighter yellow lots, 78 townhouse dwellings. So more of your row house dwelling, which is the, uh, the orange or the, the more faded orange. Um, and we're also introducing, and I'm going to provide a bit more info on what this looks like in a moment, uh, stacked back-to-back -back townhouses, um, which are in the blocks that are those darker orange color, uh, some three blocks further south by the stormwater pond, and then two blocks further north, closer to Main Street. And then uh, the, the red blocks closer to Maine are intended to be for the ability to have either medium density residential or the option to incorporate uh, commercial uses on the ground floor. Uh, the blue block on the south end is a stormwater management block. It was, it was put there um, for the most part as a natural extension of stormwater management that's been developed to the east of there. Um, the original plan had two entrances to Main Street, one Rundle Lane, which exists, and a proposed new entrance further west of there, which you can see kind of in between the red mixed use blocks. Um, what we call a, a call a MUP or a multi use path or trail is also proposed. That's that green line on the west side of Rundle Lane. It's, it's essentially um, an improved sort of active transportation corridor, it's an extra wide sidewalk that also doubles as sort of options for both pedestrians and um, cyclists to provide just improved active transportation. It's wider and will provide a connection to um, developing open space network to the east. We've also in the original submission provided some uh, uh, pedestri future pedestrian connections to lands to the west. The lands to the west are also in that greenfield designation. So they're they're slated already for residential development. So in anticipation of that, we wanted to provide uh, for those connections. Those are those purple uh, narrower uh, lines between lots along the west side of the development. And I guess the, the last thing I just note in recognition of some of the planning policies that we looked at early on is this idea of gradation of density. So we've really focused more of our more of the density towards the south in the stormwater management pond and, and CN rail, um, maintain more low and medium density residential development in the middle of, of the development and where it abuts existing lower and medium density residential. And then again, you know, a gradation up again towards Main Street where we're seeing a bit more density. Next slide, please. So we um, had a public open house in, in December, uh, it was December 14th of last year. It was, uh, we squeaked in an in-person event before we had another shutdown. And uh, it, was, it was really positive from, from our perspective. It was great to have a more informal session where we had boards of, plan, of the plan and, and different um, aspects of the project on display, members of the project team, the civil engineer, the builder there to answer questions and, and clarify things. Um, we did receive uh, a number of initial comments, um, which we've been reviewing since then. Um, some of the feedback that we received and kind of bright showing up on the screen, so I'll walk you through it. Um, ensuring appropriate setbacks from nearby agricultural uses was a note heard. Um, mitigating groundwater and runoff uh, impacts on adjacent properties was also comments that we heard. Um, there was also feedback around the uh, Rundle Lane intersection and questions on whether it could be realigned with Simpson, uh, which is just to the north, but slightly offset to the east. Um, there were also, we, as through our feedback received, there was both, uh, verbal as well as comment cards. So there was a, a comment received in writing regarding, um, some discussions that have been had to date about a possible, uh, traffic circle at Rundle and Main Street and, and concerns that, uh, that might be premature at this time, um, because of, uh, continued agricultural uh, vehicles using Main Street and their ability to navigate a traffic circle. So it's something else that we noted. Um, as well, um, there was a comment that there may not be enough green space 
uh, in proximity to some of the higher density residential uses located in the north part of the site was something we also heard. And then Lens RV also let us know that they, they want us to be cognizant of the fact they have an existing entrance on Rundle Lane that has trailers coming in and out um, and to ensure that we you know, don't have any uh, compatibility issues with that multi-use trail as, as they continue to operate their business. Um, and in the meantime, we've also received technical comments from staff as well. IBI was retained to peer review uh, the planning and the technical aspects of the project. So we've been going through all of that as well. And next slide, please. Uh, in response, have made revisions to the plan. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone who's contributed to date. It was great to work through that commentary and I think we've made additional improvements to the plan that I'll just quickly walk you through, um, both based on the open house and, and staff's comments. So um, one of the, the comments that we've heard through the peer review and technical comments in multiple places was, how is this project addressing affordable housing policies of the official plan? And more broadly, this is, this is an issue that every municipality is grappling with. So how can we um, better address that, that concern here? And um, so I think obviously affordable housing is a very complex matter, but I think as a private developer um, who's developing lands with a subdivision, one of the ways in which they can help contribute to that addressing that problem is through achieving essentially as much density as possible, but of course, while still maintaining compatibility uh, and not overdeveloping the area, as well providing that, that real mix of uses and options for folks who maybe can't afford a single detached dwelling. So in response, we reduce the number of single detached and semi-detached dwellings slightly and increase the number of row houses as well as the stacked back-to-back -back, uh, dwellings. Um, and the nice thing about the stacked back-to-back -back dwellings, you can see the, the draft building footprints there on the orange blocks. Regard those blocks won't really change, but they can accommodate 10 uh, two and three bedroom units, or they can accommodate up to 20, 22 units that include bachelors and one bedroom units that could be rented, they could be condominiumized, providing more options to folks and, and getting more units on the market to hopefully help with affordability, but different types of units as well. So that was a, that was a big change. Um, another comment through technical circulation was, um, concerns with whether the proposed west entrance off of Main Street had a far enough separation from Rundle. Uh, and we looked at that more closely with our traffic engineer and they determined that the, the TAC manual, which is the manual that the province provides for reviewing traffic, um, showed it was in fact too close. Um, so we've removed that entrance road. Uh, however, the, that mixed use block, which you can see we've also reconfigured to be more oriented to Main Street would have its own entrance. It would not require circulation through the neighborhood. Um, another comment we heard from staff, uh, which we fully agreed with and, and looked at right away was um, providing actual future road connections to the west, not just pedestrian connections. So you'll see we've widened those purple blocks um, going to the west in anticipation that those lands are slated for development. So Portland and Royal Gala uh, could be extended to accommodate that growth to the west. Uh, in response to comments about wanting more green space in towards higher density residential, we've included uh, a parquette at the northwest corner of Brayburn and Rundle Lane um, that can support uh, more of the open space needs of those in the stacked back-to-back -to -back, uh, townhouses as well as those in the retirement home. But again, still achieving that gradation and density, keeping the low and the medium density next to the existing subdivision in phases one and two and moving some of that higher density towards Main Street and towards CN Rail and the stormwater pond. Next slide, please. So I'll just quickly walk you through some um, products that this builder has, has completed to date to give you a sense of what these different building typologies look like. So this is an example of a single detached dwelling that, that they've built in the area uh, and where these will be located or proposed to be located in the subdivision. Next slide, please. 
sample semi-detached dwelling that we could see um, as an example in those uh, brighter yellow colored lots. Next slide, please. These are some samples of the builder's row houses or, or townhouses, which are proposed for the orange colored lots. Next slide, please. So this is uh, where I'll just take a brief, brief moment. This is a sample of what this builder has developed in Coburg. It's their stacked back-to-back -back townhouse dwelling. So stacked back-to-back -back means it's a type of townhouse dwelling and it's not only attached on the sides, um, so vertically as you would see in a traditional townhouse, but also on the backside as well. So they're stacked vertically and horizontally. And like I said, this built form, as you see it here, could accommodate as low as 10 units, but bigger bedroom count, or as high as 20, 22 with more bachelors in one bedroom units. More density, but same built form, which is really what's nice about this, this form of housing. It's, it's kind of what we call that, that, that middle, uh, the missing middle, which a lot of communities that are growing faster are lacking. It's two and a half stories in height. So that um, lower level is actually half below grade. Every unit has its own independent entrance. So it's not, uh, it's not an apartment building. It's, um, they are kind of more walk-up style townhouses. Um, while it is two and a half stories through, you know, architectural design and articulation, you can sort of achieve that transition and stepping in height. So the ends are actually just um, more like two stories. And you can see th too through materiality and, and color um, and architecture, it can be really broken down to read more as a townhouse rather than a multi-unit dwelling. So we're pretty excited about uh, introducing that in this, in this location. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is not a product that this builder has developed, but it's a sample to give you the sort of idea of what could be achieved in, in that mixed use block. So sort of a low mid rise form where we can have opportunities for cafes and at grade retail, small scale, um, and then residential units above. Next slide, please. So a few open space considerations. Um, through the earlier phases of this subdivision, the developer provided, I think about three times the parkland dedication required for those phases. Um, so we're not proposing as significant of actual conveyance or, or dedication of parkland in this case. However, that parquet that I mentioned is proposed um, at the northwest corner of Rundle Lane and Brayburn. And then the stormwater management pond in the south will naturally extend from the open space trail network with stormwater management as well that's already under development to the east. So it'll provide opportunities for around that storm pond, the trails can continue westward and hopefully continue on further west after this development as well. Next slide, please. So of course we, we do a lot of um, professional review in support of these applications. So this is a list of all of the supporting studies that were prepared in last summer and, and fall to support the fall uh, submission. So planning review, the environmental impact studies. So that's the, the birds and the bees and the environmental site assessment that's looking at soil condition, all of the uh, servicing and, and engineering pieces, traffic, noise, vibration for the rail line, geotechnical archeological assessment is, is the work that's been completed. Next slide, please. Um, just looking uh, at the official plan amendment that we're proposing. So that would include bringing the entirety of the site into the residential designation. So uh, acknowledging the relocation of the water course, removing that EP and then bringing the green fields into the residential. Um, and we would also be amending the transportation schedule um, to uh, reflect the new road network that's proposed. Next slide, please. There we go, thank you. Uh, and this is, uh, Mr. Walsh uh, did a great job of kind of providing an overview of the zoning bylaw amendment, but this visually gives you a better sense of how uh, the proposed zoning will, will encompass the different land uses and and there's uh, site-specific performance standards to implement appropriate setbacks and, and coverage and, and aspects like, like that. We've got open space for the uh, stormwater block, environmental protection zoning for the wetland buffer, and then a series of residential zones to implement the, 
the different residential uses that uh, I presented this evening. Next slide, please. Um, so that that's, uh, concludes my presentation and Cody and I would be happy to respond to any questions from council or members of the public. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just gonna carry on with uh, the protocol here and I will ask if there are any persons present in the gallery who wish to speak in favor of the application. In favor? Are you gonna speak in favor of the application? That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> Uh, are we aware of anyone joining us by Zoom who would want to speak in favor of the application? All right. So is there anyone in the gallery who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? I think that's you, Brenda. <laughs> we'll just get Ms. Wood, if you could um, vacate that seat for us for a moment. And I'll, uh, I'll ask if you have any final comments when we get there. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, uh, this in regards to the Sorry, story- Sorry, Brenda, I, we know who you are, but could you please introduce yourself for the record? My name is Mrs. Brenda Richardson, 104 Raglan Street, Brighton, Ontario. Thank you. Um, in the stormwater management uh, report on the agenda, it says by Jewel Engineer that uh, stormwater from phase three of the development will be conveyed to the existing phase two stormwater management pond, which provides quality and control. On the February 23rd, 2021 agenda on page three, Jewel Engineering states, that the Orchard Gate Pond was assumed by the Municipality of Brighton in 2016. Quotations therefore has met their phase one and phase two obligations. Ministry of Brighton, Municipality of Brighton is responsible for maintenance. I, I emailed you a copy that I, when I was in touch with my uh, MECP contact, stating that the ECA is still in the applicant's name. It also stated in the improved stormwater management plan by EOR stated that there was no amended ECA. First and foremost, where and who did Jewel Engineering get this information from stating that the pond had been assumed? Um, also at a previous council meeting, it was pointed out that um, the pond does not meet MECP capacity regu uh, regulations. And Mr. Parkinson was asked if the ECA violation had been reported to the MECP and he said he would look into it, but we've never heard back on that. My question is, I find this all extremely confusing as to who owns this pond. I don't think that they should go ahead with this if phase three is going to flow into this pond when we've been told that we don't know who owns it, the municipality uh, Your Worship, you emailed me and told me that a lawyer had been hired. However, now on the stormwater management plan on the agenda, it says staff originally expressed concern regarding the need to eventually assume two stormwater master ponds. So the question is, do we own the pond as the town? There's violations, it doesn't meet its capacity. And as a taxpayer, I don't feel that we should have to come out of the taxpayer's dollar for a developer. Now, it was mentioned that the EC was, had never been transferred over. So like, could somebody please explain to me who owns this pond and why should this be moved forward when there are violations, ECA violations on the pond right now that have not been done and that should not be fixed by the taxpayer's account. So the Orchard Gate Pond that you speak of is not part of this report. The phase two stormwater pond, <clears throat> pardon me, is not the Orchard Gate Pond. It is the pond that is immediately to the west of the pond described underneath phase four of the subdivision. So the phase four of the subdivision, you see phase three pond immediately be below phase three of the subdivision is the phase two pond, which is being considered this evening. And then to the west of that is the Orchard Gate Pond, which we're waiting for a staff report on. So it is not part and parcel of this subdivision. 
So still, nor, nor are we considering anything that would drain into that pond this evening because nothing from these. So what's draining into Orchard Gate Pond? Just phase one? One and two. Phase two, that it says from phase three of the development will be conveyed to the existing phase two stormwater management pond. That's where I got that from. How right. my understanding is that it was still because phase one and two flow into that pond. Right, so we're talking about two different things, right? Phase one and two of the development flow into Orchard Gate. Phase three and four, three of the development flows into phase two pond. And phase four of the development will flow into what's being called SWM on my diagram in front of me. Okay, so then if that's the case, it's still, I think phase one and two it should be settled before we move on and have more ponds that the town is assuming. Can you tell me, can I ask you where we sit right now with the ownership of uh, Orchard Gate Pond? I understand that a staff report is imminent. That's all I know for sure. Could you tell me why that no one on staff is accepting the MEC's uh, email that saying that the uh, ECA is still is in the applicant's name? I cannot, I don't, I cannot speak for staff or why they're not accepting that or if they're not accepting that, I don't know. We're waiting for a staff report to come forward, which we know to be imminent, but that's not part of tonight's statutory public meeting. Well, March 15, 2021, a year is pretty long. Is there anyone in the gallery who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Please step forward. My name is Nancy Wiskin and I live on Royal Gala. On the earlier site plan that we showed, it showed two access roads coming off Highway 2. On the latter plans that were cited, it showed the elimination of the one to the west, which means you've got over 500 homes funneling up Rundle. And my concern is traffic volume and the fact that the traffic now is filling over and coming up, not just Rundle Lane, but Empire Avenue, which is the only access into our development to the east. And I was wondering whether the opportunity to reinstigate that extra road to the west of Rundle is a viable option. We're here to receive your comments this evening. So your comment is that you would prefer to have a, a third, if you will, access to the subdivision. Um, I'd ask you to please put that in writing to ensure that we have it. Uh, but I know that the planner has made notes on that as well. I, I'm watching him do that. It's a huge development yeah. for a town of our size. And I think the impact on our infrastructures is going to be really significant. We've got two small grocery stores and I don't know whether or not the rest of the facilities in town can support a, a development of this size. Particularly, we also have applications for land development going on Ontario Street, which are going to be large as well. Thank there. you. Thank you, Nancy, appreciate your comments. Does anyone else in the gallery wish to speak against the application or in opposition to the application? Is there anyone on Zoom who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Denise Rundle, is that what I'm seeing? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council uh, members. My name is Denise Rundle, R-U-N-D-L-E. Um, my mother-in-law actually resides at 144 Elizabeth Street. She's 89 years old and she's not one of the 12 direct mailings that this, uh, these applications uh, were sent to. She has some general concerns. Um, I see Brighton as well uh, in my particular future as I've been going there for the past 30 years for holidays and remembrance uh, 
um, activities, etc. My parents lived on Alice Street for uh, decades, and uh, my brother as well uh, lived in Brighton, and I see Brighton in my future. She showed me just yesterday, unfortunately, the newspaper uh, advertising the notice of, of public meeting tonight. So I believe our comments are going to be quite general as this process has been going on, I understand, for a number of months. So um, all we'd like to say is that um, we've noticed primarily, we believe due to COVID, uh, we've seen a lot of residents from larger cities and communities coming to the smaller uh, areas like Brighton for a, qu a quieter quality of life. We've seen this evidence in Brighton and Trenton um, where large former agricultural and vacant lands are being replaced with hundreds of homes in one fell swoop such as the one that's before you right now, creating whole communities pretty much unto themselves. But it's hard for us uh, to give any meaningful comments as the uh, member of the public spoke just earlier, to give any meaningful comments on a high level policy change in your official plan from Greenfield with an environmental protection component to allow for residential units of 556 to commenting on a subdivision design or road design and accesses, stormwater management, etc., or providing comments on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment permitting 50 foot single family residential lots and reduced exterior side yards, for example. Never mind giving a comment on a severance. Now I understand from the applicant's presentation. I understand what that's all about, but it's an awful lot to digest as a resident. My mother-in-law certainly wouldn't have been able to figure it out. And, um, and it can be extremely overwhelming to have really meaningful resident input. Brighton's on the eastern edge of the greater Toronto Horseshoe. It's not in a major urban center. This site is on the edge of your own urban area in Brighton. This is where, in my opinion and my mother-in-law's opinion, density becomes important. The report talks about a gradation of density from north to south, I understand that. There's a very small frontage on Main Street with this parcel, so that makes sense to have the transition of density. I'm also looking at a gradation and transition of density from west to east, or from rural to urban. Um, the report identified that the minimum density target for the county in Northumberland is 25 people per net hectare. But what's being proposed here is a density of 59 dwelling units per net hectare within 400 meters of Main Street. And that is expected to exceed the minimum density targets. That may sound good in some cases, but it's our opinion that this is not the downtown of Brighton. It's on the edge of the urban area. And given its location at the entrance to the urban area and primarily on a major, major arterial being a gateway to Brighton, that the density should be reduced to meet the minimum density targets and the requirements of the provincial policy statement and the growth plan, the county and Northumberland official plan and Brighton zone official plan. If we have minimum density targets, so be it. Once you've made the decision to change this agricultural land to residential, but you have to think of the context and location. Brighton is being challenged like never before that I've seen in the last 30 years from very highly skilled and resource developers. We're an easy target with clean land, large swaths of clean land. It's very easy for a developer to take that uh, slate and develop a subdivision plan. There's no major challenges except for the fact that there was a water course, an environmental protection area bisecting vertically the whole parcel, but they've addressed that. Yes, we need to grow. We need the assessment. We need a variety of housing styles. We also need the infrastructure and we need the jobs and we need the social services and transit that go along with that in our opinion. We'll be servicing well over, well over a thousand people from this proposal alone that this proposal is gonna generate. Yes, the population is changing. 
Um, it's no longer the sleepy little bedroom retiree community. We do want to get younger people into Brighton, I believe. And it begs the question, where are they going to work? Are they going to be catching the bus to Trenton to work? I suspect this development is still going to be vehicle oriented. Now, often I hear of transit oriented, medium density developments that we need there, compact developments, all those provincial policies that I read in the staff report, and, and even conversation of a bus stop. If council considers all these thousand people to be taking the bus to work, I'm not sure where they're going to be working, if it's all in downtown or in other uh, industrial areas around Brighton, I suspect we're still going to need a vehicle. But in my opinion, and my mother-in-law's, and we had all of this discussion yesterday when I went to go see her for Mother's Day, um, that council has the power. They have the power and they can push back on some of these densities. Most developers, in my experience, and even previously in another development in Brighton, um, always propose the highest order of development. But most developers, I believe, also expect it to be reduced. And as I read in the report today, this is the third submission from the applicant. Um, but we don't want to let the density set the precedent because there's other large vacant agricultural parcels of land, in particular at the east end of the urban area boundary. And we don't want to set the precedent that you can go way beyond the minimum required targets that we need. So in summary, I commend staff for coordinating a very significant amount of review, technical review and work that's been done on this application, working with the applicant after reading the report this afternoon. And, and given that is the third submission, there's a lot of technical issues that need to be addressed that don't so much concern us as a resident, but I know that council will have the town's best interest in mind when considering any higher density while achieving your mix of housing, of course, and the other policy initiatives that come in through the official plans and the provincial policy statement, looking at this location, we can achieve those objectives and meet the minimum density requirement. There's no need to be exceeding it. We satisfy the province, the county of Northumberland, the town of Brighton's official plan once you made your decision to change it from agriculture. We're doing our part provincially to accommodate the movement of people into our small communities, but we don't want to destroy the quaint character and charm of Brighton, which has made it such a desirable location and place to raise your family for me and for others everybody else in the first place. So we need to be very, very careful. So we're already allowing an increase in density because there's nothing permitted there now anyway. So let's just meet the minimum targets and the applicant wins and the town wins. And we've done our due diligence to provincial documents and our own local documents, but we also intend to balance the growth that we need in Brighton with the minimum requirements and targets that have been set out. And as a resident and as speaking for my mother-in-law, um, she would support the development, but at the minimum uh, targets that have already been established in the official plan, the transit oriented compact development, we're not in a big city, we're not in a big town. This is Brighton. We're already doing our due diligence by allowing hundreds of homes being built in our vicinity, and we're gonna see more. But we also need to see the other services that support this population. Because the younger people coming in using technology, they're gonna be driving. I don't think a lot of them are gonna be taking that transit on Main Street. So we, when I saw that in the report that it exceeds the minimum target, there's no reason for it. In my opinion, as a resident, um, speaking on behalf of my mother-in-law and as a future resident, I plan to be in Brighton. So thank you very much for all of your work that you're doing. I know it's unprecedented, it's overwhelming, and I appreciate all the work that the councillors do on behalf of us. It's not easy and it's gonna get harder. So thank you for letting me speak, Mr. Mayor and council members. And um, 
I'll leave it at that. And I did request in writing, uh, I think at 429, get in a written request to ask for a copy of notice of decision as required. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Rundle. And I will um, just advise that I think maybe you're talking about the letter that's um, under Sonia's name uh, yes. that's dated today. We have received it and it will be put into the record. And uh, I do note that uh, you've requested a notice of, of decision from council. So the clerk will be sure to provide that to you or to, uh, to the other Mrs. Rundle for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Is there anyone else on Zoom who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? I'll let you speak again if you'd like, yeah. I'd just like to interject that I'm not opposed to development. It's the size of the development that I'm concerned about. And we already are challenged with the number of physicians that we need to acquire for our town. And with new people coming in, even if you factor in two people per home, that's another thousand people. And if there are children involved, that becomes even higher. And with the children becomes a demand on our school system. Our schools are maxed out at the moment. And that's something that needs to be considered as well with this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask just one last time if there's anyone either in the gallery or on Zoom who wishes to speak in opposition to the application. And I will remind everyone that uh, they can put their um, uh, comments in writing and provide them to the uh, planning department either uh, by dropping them off physically to the clerk's office here at 35 Alice Street or mailing them to us or by email to planning at brighton.ca. Are there any members of council who have questions or comments with regard to uh, the information in the statutory public meeting? Councillor Bateman. Uh, a couple questions. The first one, if I'm not sure if it's Mr. Walsh or their planner, just the total number of bills, because I'm getting, depending on where I'm looking, different totals. If I look at the documentation from Lower Trent, it's one total. If I look at the report, it's another total. So if I could just have clarification on how many we're talking. Director? Sure, the, I'll first explain the discrepancy. The Lower Trent Conservation Authority comments were on the first concept and the more uh, recent concept was, it was yet uh, to uh, hear back from the Conservation Authority uh, on that. But in terms of the actual numbers, phase three it remains 34 units and phase uh, four is 521 units. Is it 121? 521. 521, thank yeah, you. So it's 521 plus 34. Yeah, thank you. Follow up, Councilor Pittman. Uh, so just a follow up on the Lower Trent portion. So if these numbers that Lower Trent spoke to have, is there documentation showing the, what they have said for the newest update? I don't think that's attached a new report from them. No, their comments were focused on the stormwater management and environmental protection component. And they just simply ask for an opportunity to comment at the design stage. So when we get into the working drawings of things, uh, then we involve uh, Laura Trent for, for commenting on those uh, uh, implementational uh, details. Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple of questions. Um, some maybe brought up. Mrs. Rundle uh, spoke about uh, the minimum number of, uh, res of uh, residential units could be there. Would you have that number? Just looking for a compromise, maybe? Sure. Director? I believe the, number, the minimum number in the county and Brighton official plan is 25 uh, um, units right. uh, per net hectare. Okay. that hectare being uh, the developable acreage after you've accounted for storm parks, streets, et cetera. And uh, the um, northern portion of the de development, the higher density, the mixed use, it is something that uh, has a strong policy basis as well. Um, the mixed use is considered to be a very efficient design, you know, live, work, play, shop uh, in close proximity. So, so there has been some encouragement to move towards mixed use, which they provided. 
as well, there's lots of provincial policy of strongly encouraging transit support of densities. And the province has guidelines. Different levels of density provide certain levels of convenience for bus service. And it was hoped that we achieve some minimum density to achieve some of those guideline standards up from the province to make uh, uh, feasible a transit system for all of the community, not just this neighborhood. Uh, but once once established, if established, then it would be something uh, more available to, to everyone. Thank you. As a follow-up? Uh, yes. So we're talking, uh, the minimum number is 25 per hectare, 25 units. And how many are we dealing with here? 59 units per hectare. So we're over double. Okay. Um, I have another couple of questions, may I ask? Or I'll, I'll I can go. take a turn. Yeah, I'll go to someone else if okay. you don't mind. I'll come back to you, Councillor Bateman. Uh, uh, for the director or for the uh, planner, for the developer, and I apologize for all the questions. I actually sent some on the 14th and the director was kind enough to answer them because I was not able to attend back in December. Uh, this question revolves around, uh, and it can tie into the number, the 25 to the 59, because on previous uh, developments have come forward or proposals, we've asked for a certain percentage of second dwellings. And we also asked for those, the, the percentage to be built, ready to go so that whoever bought it, if they wanted to use it, not to do it later. So what's the percentage that is being recommended for this? And is there a possibility that we look at upping the percentage of second dwellings required and lowering the overall number for the density? Director? Yes, to be consistent with some of the recent draft approvals as recommended by staff, the proponent has been indicated that, that they could expect that condition, that a minimum 10% of all the singles and semis would be subject to uh, a re requirement of having a second unit. In fact, the request is to show a plot plan that would demonstrate a typical second unit build out, and they have submitted that. Uh, in terms of having those second units be provided in lieu of different forms or densities that hasn't been suggested. Um, as you heard the, the professional planner, Jennifer Wood, speak that the stacked townhouses, et cetera, they provide some flexibility as to the bedroom counts. So whether they be singles or you know, double bedroom or three bedroom or studios, there's some flexibility there. Uh, the second units don't offer that same level of flexibility. If there is a real need in the community for three bedrooms, for example, I, I, typically a second unit wouldn't be able to provide that in a, say, a basement environment. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you. Just a comment and a question. When we're looking at smaller units, uh, they're much more affordable, but then they also increase um, the density, which we have to keep in mind. I know increased density is concerning for some people and I, and I get it, but we also are trying to create, you know, uh, when they're talking about units that are just, you know, want a small one or two bedroom, we need those as well. So anyway, that's just my comment. Um, and we always have hear, hear concerns about infrastructure when we do these large developments. And uh, just for clarity, um, what kinds of infrastructure do we have control over and, and are there provisions for that before this sort of thing can even come before council for a decision? Director. Uh, through, through the mayor to council, through the deputy mayor. Um, yeah, there's a, a functional service report that has been submitted and there is modeling being done and there are improvements that will be required. And as referenced in the staff report, uh, not only for the provision of sanitary and for water, um, that uh, in the residual capacity at the lagoon, that uh, there would be allocation of that residual capacity only at the time of the registration of a uh, subphase of the subdivision. Uh, you'll see reference in the staff report perhaps that um, this has been a direction by staff to the proponent that there would not be a major or a wholesale allocation of residual sanitary at draft approval. That would only come at the time ex of execution of the subdivision agreement. And also uh, in previous council sessions, staff have made reference to 
expecting a, a policy to come forward about allocation of residual sanitary capacity. So uh, uh, that policy will come come soon. And uh, so um, not just to address this development, it'll be a, a general policy for the urban area of municipality of Brighton. And I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have concerns, um, not so much. I like the size of the uh, types of uh, the multi at 20 unit or 10 unit. Uh, I saw them in Coburg. I think they're talked to some people that have actually lived in them. And uh, so I think that type of thing, uh, we, we probably should see more of that rather than that'll create some of the help, some of the density. But uh, I'd like to see more green space here. I, 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 a number of us feel the same way. The part at how many, uh, is it an acre, is it two acres? How large is the park at, or not the park at the, uh, is it called the park at? Yeah, how large is that? Be yeah, honest with you, I'm, I don't recall offhand. I'll have to defer to the proponent about the park at. Save that one then. Uh, I'd like to know because it could be a postage stamp. So, well, actually, Ms. Wood, do you have, do you have that answer? Please. <laughs> All right. Might as well get the answer now. Sure. Okay. Hmm. I don't see any people like the door to join him or nothing here. You can see. Hmm? You can see. Thank you. Yeah. Right. It's it's less than an acre. I believe it's around a quarter of an acre. Um, but I can confirm that it would be considered a, a parquet. So it wouldn't be the size of a park that would be you know, programmed with play equipment, it would be more of a, a small scale neighborhood parquet for seating, maybe a pergola um, and green space. I, I would also just highlight that um, the Planning Act requires 5% of the land be conveyed for parkland dedication uh, for residential and 2% for commercial lands. Um, and phases one and two of the subdivision provided um, three times the parkland conveyance requirements immediately next door to the east. So as part of our latest response, there are a series of calculations that we provided that compared how much was previously conveyed, the level of overage, and that we're still exceeding between the two subdivisions, including the parkette, the minimum uh, planning act requirement. Uh, I see what you did with the first phase. I, I think that's fine. and. And uh, near the ponds, I know there's trails there and that type of thing. You mentioned trails near the ponds here. I don't think that'll be part of the, the, the uh, green space uh, provided to the municipality, will it? It will be the, it'll be the municipality green space eventually, but it's not being donated as, uh, the word donate, but it's not being contributed as the green space from the developer. Through the chair. so. You're correct, it will ultimately be conveyed to the municipality to own a stormwater management, but that doesn't count towards the minimum parkland dedication requirement. It does, it does, does, does not. not, does, does not. not. So no. we've got a quarter acre here. Yes, through these phases, in addition to the overage provided. So I just feel uncomfortable with the potential of a mm -hmm. residents with hopefully some children and the need some space because there's nothing near there really. So mm -hmm. anyhow, uh, that mm -hmm. was just one question. Yeah, thank you. Noted. And that can be discussed. Uh, schools. Uh, school Hang on. Whoa, whoa. Can I have a couple questions? No, nope. everybody else got one. So well, I'll come back to you. Councillor Tadman. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Away. Wilson, <laughs> I think that was your name. Yes, it has some really good points. And uh, we do have a shortage of doctors. And so now if this goes through, we're gonna have a real problem because we're gonna need a doctor just for that area. And the other thing, you're very correct. And uh, I have some association with the schools and I know that they're packed to the limit right now. So I would think in an area like this would be attractive to young couples with young children. And uh, Councillor Anderson, I agree with you. I don't see a good area 
for children to play. And, and a lot of those places won't even have yards where they can go out in the backyard to play. So uh, I just think this is, the density is just exaggerated far too much. And I think we should go uh, absolutely half of this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll ask one more question and I'll come back to some more. Um, uh, earlier this year or last year, we had to uh, increase uh, some water main infrastructure, if I recall, over, that was off Ontario Street, right? That was also to service um, the uh, Orchard Gate subdivision. Um, is that now going to be enough to um, service over as far now as uh, the Applewood uh, subdivision as well? Is, has, was that taken into consideration when we did this? So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mr. Gooding who has a bit more expertise in infrastructure than I. Thank you. <clears throat> Vice Mayor, <laughs> Mayor Council is, uh, the functional servicing report identified that up to a certain amount of homes can be serviced on the existing main. And at some point, the main on Kenner Road 2 would have, or Main Street we have to be upsized and oversized to accommodate regional flows. So um, now that we have funding for uh, doing that work, um, we will be modeling uh, this development as well as um, future expansion to the West in order to size the water main on, on Karen Road 2, or sorry, it's Main Street, um, to, uh, to construct that and extend it and provide the servicing. So the timing works out well that there will be adequate water flow for this development. So that's, that's part of what we're doing then to increase the water flow that on Main Street, which will kind of help service these subdivisions. Then. That's correct. And, and the other benefit too is, is by having this development feed off at the end of that main is it provides a, a looping and, and freshen, freshens water so we're not having stagnant water at the end of the main okay. and they have to avoid flushing it. Okay, thank you. I've got some more, but I'll wait my turn. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Uh, thank well, you. Some of the questions have been asked, uh, so I'll skip around here. Uh, it was mentioned uh, relocating the the water that runs through the property and Councillor Tabman and I would have already seen that when we on lower trends so we knew that was going to take place so my question is though and you can couple in the you had mentioned the extra wide sidewalk as well the long sidewalk once whatever scale this is completed to does that become the responsibility of the municipality and has the staff factored in what would be the cost of you know if there's pipe breakage could now We've never relocated a stream underwater, so now we have pipage underground. Are we going to be responsible for the upkeep of that, and also for the upkeep of that sidewalk? Uh, Mr. Gooding, so uh, I'm understanding the relocation of the stormwater. Um, I believe all those conditions would be outlined in the subdivision agreement on, on uh, maintenance and what schedules. At what point do we assume it? Um, they would have to install the or make the install the infrastructure at phase one in order to accommodate stormwater for most of the development uh, in the first place. And then as they complete future phasing, uh, they would just connect into that or, or work around within that. Um, but it wouldn't be uh, municipalities until we're ready to assume um, that infrastructure. Follow up. So I'm making reference to the stream that's gonna be relocated. So that's gonna be tied into the stormwater because that, that, that the stream that's above surface now, you're gonna take it below surface so that property could be built on top of that. So I'm, I'm just wondering who, who's responsible for the upkeep of what you're taking below ground. I think, I think, I think it's a drainage ditch. Is that what you're referring yeah, to, the drainage, drainage ditch? It's gonna be relocated on under... Mr. Gooding, so, do you wanna take that? Uh, I can take it or Corey, um, or Cody, sorry. Is, uh, uh, there, in phase one, I believe there's a, that's that three meter um, easement alongside, uh, Rundling um, that will end up capturing that stream and re-diverting it into a storm pipe to the south um, and then into the stormwater pond that would also be constructed as part of phase one. Would you like that to that? Mr. Orham, go ahead. I push the lavender button right in front of you there. Okay, try the, yeah, there you go. Go ahead. Perfect, uh, through mayor. Um, just to clarify, the, the three meter easement is to facilitate the, the joint use utility if required along that west side. Um, the storm sewer itself can fit within the Rundle right of way. So it would travel over to Rundle and down to the, uh, um, the, the catchment that goes under the railroad tracks. 
Uh, correct. Yes, it would travel under Rundle, um, extend to the south, and then south of Royal Gala, uh, enter into a natural channel that's to be constructed. Thank you. Councillor LeBlanc, did you have a question? Yes, uh, Mayor. I have a number of questions, but I'll, I'll take my turn like the rest. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for the Director of Planning. Uh, we've allotted money for a secondary plan on how our roads, how our building, how we were going to build, how the community was going to look, and everything. So, where are we in that secondary plan? If we go with this tonight, how does it throw it off, or are we wasting the, the taxpayers' money again? I don't. I don't think this area of the community is covered by the secondary plan. Is it, Director? Uh, to the Mayor, to Council. Uh, thank you, Councilor Blanc, for the question. We've uh, had that dialogue with the proponent, letting them know that the secondary plan is ongoing and the, the phasing of the development is uh, from south to north. So um, some of the prime questions such as uh, uh, Nancy's earlier comments about having a, a street day after all and these sorts of things, they, can still, they will still need to be uh, integrated within the secondary plan. Uh, and so we haven't forgot about the secondary plan. It, it is ongoing. And the applicant's been advised that there would need to be some integration with the secondary plan, uh, potentially post uh, draft approval, that maybe certain late registrations of the subdivision cannot happen until the secondary plan is concluded. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I'm gonna tie it together here. Um, the density issue is, is, is top of my mind top of my mind, but it's right there close to uh, uh, looking at the full community. Uh, I'm not sure what the school board has said about this. They will make a comment on it if they haven't. Uh, it's true, the schools are at their max. In other communities near us, neighbors, the provincial government announced adding more classrooms to those schools uh, west of us, east of us, and even further. And that's because the same thing's going on in those communities. But um, one thing I'd touch on tonight, if I could, is this extra uh, access or street. Um, I think uh, I heard our, one of our speakers tonight touched on it, and uh, I think it, it's a very real uh, concern about having Rundle being as well as it, it flowing, taking shortcuts, or whatever. Eventually, uh, only two real access to this. Uh, the present and maybe the future that there might be as you go further west possibly or somebody builds to the west but i think it, it should be considered in this uh, development unless you know for a fact that 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 would happen in in the very near future now this development's going to be phase three i can i can I, i'm just guessing how long this will take to build out and as things build out things do happen in the community and schools get developed, uh, businesses get developed, extra growth stores get developed, and, and you have commercial space here along Main Street. You're looking at, you use coffee shop. It might be more, more than that for all we know, right? And, but you also have three more commercial spaces over by the uh, retirement home that, uh, um, that are gonna be down the road very soon. I, I think somewhere uh, we're gonna be talking about. So, Rundle Lane uh, entrance traffic lights probably at some point, and I think that we may need to discuss that with the developer. And what's Main Street going to look like? And then that somebody may comment. Uh, what's our entrance way to Brighton? What's Main Street going to look like when this is done? Uh, we need to think of that as. as a municipality. I just want to congratulate you, Councilor Anderson, for getting three questions in one. No, I, I, it, I, it was it'll be a it was the most it, remarkable thing I've ever seen. A lot, so it'll be a, it'll be a while before it gets quite good. fantastic. <laughs> well done. Has the school board been circulated? Yes, Mayor. It's an attachment. To, I think it's the last attachment to the staff report. Thank you. I just wanted to get that out there that the school board is aware that this development's coming and and has had opportunity to consider the population growth. Uh, as, as we move it forward. Um, 
I'm not sure who would, uh, there, there was a, there was another question about traffic in there. The question was what, what will Main Street the, look the like? Access road. Sorry. And I'm, I'm assuming that as we always do, a traffic study has been or will be conducted as, uh, as we determine what the final plan will look like. Yes, there has been a traffic impact study submitted and uh, staff are currently reviewing the reiteration of that in response to uh, the concept uh, two that's been submitted. So Thank you. there are some outstanding issues for sure. Thank you. And just, just a reminder, this is to receive these kinds of comments so that staff are aware of the okay. concerns of the community and can bring back a, a proper recommendation to Council. Council Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wish I could ramble like uh, Councillor Anderson over there. Oh, I could, oh I could, you can. <laughs> Your time's up, uh, Emily. Uh. <laughs> so uh, one question, ha um, setbacks uh, regarding the um, agriculture operation uh, that's just to the west. Uh, you, you touched on it just a little bit in your presentation. Um, I'm just interested more in maybe details on that, please. And um, I mean, at this stage, that's still being farmed actively. And I, I'm hoping that um, the um, farmer isn't um, kind of losing anything on, on that. Um, on that. Part. Thank you. And I'll turn the floor over to Ms. Wood. But I will also let council know that when I was at the open house in December, both, <clears throat> both of the neighboring farmers were actively at that open house, not just sitting back watching either. Correct. Yeah. I, I understand. I wasn't at the open house, but I understand that as well. But both but of them I were would, there. I would like to have. I, I get it. I just want. I just want everyone to know that the the local farming, two the two local farmers have been uh, very active in these discussions. Good. I, at least that's what I'm aware of. That's Ms. Wood, great. to you. Thank. You. Yes, and through you there, and there have been ongoing additional one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions between the developer uh, and that owner. So it's, it's an uh, interesting scenario in which, um, you know, for in the rural area, we have, and I'm sure it's come across your meetings before, minimum distance separation requirements, where any time in the rural area, uh, severances are proposed or new development is proposed. There's actual software that we use to confirm how much of separation new non-agricultural uses need to be from agricultural uses. Uh, with the intent of protecting those in the long term. In this case, because this property is within the urban settlement area, those types of requirements don't apply. That being said, it's uh, something that has been raised to us and it's something that we're looking at more carefully. I understand there's periods of uh, fertilization that occur where um, there's setback requirements um, from uh, residential uses. So it's something that we're looking into more uh, above and beyond what the requirement policy requirement is because that, that has uh, been raised to us and those discussions are ongoing to look at that. Yep. Yeah, it, it is a follow up because this isn't the first example of having farmland within our built boundary. Um, you know, and residents can move in there and think, you know, this is a quiet, lovely place. And then the tractors start up and the dust blows and, you know, fertilizer is done. And then we have to listen to that as well. So I just, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page when it comes to that, that needs to be, um, you know, it needs to be uh, highlighted as well in, in, in the subdivision agreement, I would think. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. I don't know that you must be seeing things. I didn't have my hand up. Thank you. Councillor LeBlanc. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I have just a few, I got a couple of questions, but I make a few comments. One on parking, which is a problem in that area now. And I see for visitors parking, they have 0.1% per, per resident for visitors parking. That'll turn that high density place into a park and there's no excess parking to go anywhere. So that'll be a problem that I have. The um, servicing for water and wastewater, there was a report brought to council on the 16th of August, 2021. Uh, it was written by the director of public works and the CAO. And at that time we had available of 1,286 homes, 700 and, and uh, 25 were used 
it allows us 621. You do the calculation with what we've allotted, it leaves us 381 homes of capacity with that report that's already been presented in front of council twice. And also in talking with Mr. Walsh about the illegal connections or connections into our sanitary sewer and the one I witnessed before I came from my mother, from my sister's funeral, and then my aunt died on the, on the way here on Sunday. So I'm going to two funerals. Basically one home in watching the sump pump and measuring is equivalent and it's on Crispin Drive is equivalent to a hundred homes a day that it was pumping out at that time with three sub pumps to keep the water out of their basement. So there's a number there that there's also stuff like this that has to be reviewed when we're looking at our capacity at our wastewater treatment plant. Those are connected into our sewer system and go there. There's also the, the existing infrastructure that they got to look at because when they built Royal Gala, they never looked at the infrastructure of this to go across Butler Creek and into Lake on, into Ontario Street to go to the lift station. So who's, who's responsible for upgrading all this infrastructure to accommodate this large growth? Mr. Walsh. I don't think it's Mr. Walsh, but I'll get him to answer the question. Uh, uh, to you, the mayor, to uh, Councilor LeBlanc. So I believe some of the developments you were referring to are in a phase one of, uh, of, of Orchard Gate, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the addresses. So this is a little bit removed from the actual approval we're looking at now. Um, but what we're doing for this development, we've, are taking, we've asked for the geotechnical study as was listed in, in uh, Ms. Wood's presentation. And we are very aware of the groundwater levels and the need to uh, make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, whether there's remedial work in previous developments that have been approved to uh, address uh, groundwater inflow into basements and its discharge into the sanitary, uh, you know, that can be reviewed and, uh, and different options uh, considered. Um, I do see it as an independent issue from this particular draft approval. Um, we may have to take a look at the flows on the existing system as this development, if approved, connects to it, because now it's going to have some uh, downstream flows to, to consider in its capacity. Uh, so, you know, the, there are potential implications, but um, you know, we can take a look as a separate uh, issue, a separate project, uh, the impacts of the uh, connected sump pumps. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. There was also a question about uh, capacity and how many homes we can build. And I think you addressed that when you said there'd be a policy coming forward so that um, new homes would be attached to the system when new phases were, were brought on board, not at subdivision uh, agreement, at, at the subdivision agreement stage. Correct, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I'm just circling back to green space. We were talking about uh, the parkette being small, which I agree. And I just want to make sure, um, I guess, in this development and any developments that uh, we're encouraging more green space, even if we're going over the you know minimum requirement. For us, I think it's important for us to develop in a way that is appealing and uh, maybe blends in more with Brighton. Um, uh, along Main Street, is there any way we can request as well? Like, I, I'd like to see more tree-lined uh, entrances. I don't really want to see a mixed-use building. I know maybe we need to, but uh, just myself, I've driven other communities, and uh, I, I see a lot of their subdivisions uh, have are tree-lined with perhaps an entrance in. Um, so I, I guess my request is just... Um, uh, for, for staff and, and, and even for the planner that um, I think there's a flavor that I think most of council is interested in and that would include um, more of a, um, uh, you know, maybe a, a greener area and more of a, a, to relate with more so the rest of Brighton. We aren't a big city. We don't want to be a big city. Yes, we're growing. We just want to do it responsibly. Thank you, Thank you for that. Councilor Bateman. Uh, if I can go back to the traffic study, because it's not here, I think that's going to be coming. You said one was done for the, the development. My question around that, we know Brighton's growing, but so is Coburn, Port Hope, Coburn, Crammy, and everybody around us. And we know the 401 is busier. And we had somebody a few months back present 
on the proposal. They're expanding the 401. So my question is, did the traffic study incorporate that that stretch is our EDR when that 401 closes that is getting busier every day? And with all this growth, not just here, but Coburg and Port Hope, because the 401, no matter which direction it closes, that becomes the EDR to connect to somewhere else. So I don't know if at some point, if that's all part of a plan where that section may have to be expanded because we're continuing to grow and the volume of traffic continues to grow. Go ahead, Cody. Yeah. Uh, thank you, through Mayor, um, addressing Councillor Bateman's uh, question. Um, so a, a transportation impact assessment was completed uh, through the assessment. Uh, they look at um, various years, uh, so they project out to 2026 and 2031 um, to project what that future traffic uh, volume is going to look like uh, throughout the roadways within the development area. Um, so that was completed through the traffic assessment. Thank you. And just a reminder to Council and the community that it is uh, the county's intention, still in the books, the plan is to move the EDR to Telephone Road so that it will go um, no, uh, north of the 401, not so. Now that's a multi-million dollar project. Uh, we were hoping for federal funding a couple of years ago that didn't come through. So um, it's uh, got to got to save our pennies uh, to get there. But uh, it's it's not um, it's not a 50 year plan. It's it's within the next dozen years that I would ex I would anticipate that that would happen. Uh, precisely because, as you say, and it goes right through downtown Colborne, right through downtown Brighton. So it's. Uh, it just causes havoc. Who's next? Councillor Anderson. You said that that would be federal money for the. That was that was on the wish list. It's unlikely to be federal money today. But the province had the money. They could have this year. But anyway, um, that is the plan, and that would be the best plan because Councillor Kim is correct. Yeah. In, in ten years from now, if that's not fixed, uh, whatever is going to happen there, uh, you won't be able to budge for weeks right you are not moving here you're not moving moving away because of the traffic but uh, i don't have any more questions i think it's your presentation is uh, pretty accurate tonight for us to be adding uh, our opinion i appreciate that uh, i'll let anybody else have. thanks next time you could start out with i don't have any further questions that'd be great Councillor leblanc i have a number of questions uh one thank you mayor your honor for uh mr cody on your, in your traffic study, did you look at our downtown with an extra 1,000, 2,000 vehicles that want to shop down there, where we're going to get the extra parking into our downtown, which is a good thing to have for all the stores in the DBIA, but where are we going to find it as a council? Have you looked at that in the traffic study? I, I can't imagine that that, that would take, um, the downtown would be part of that traffic study, Mr. Oram. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's correct. Uh, the downtown parking uh, was not assessed through the, the transportation impacts. Uh, assessment for this development. No. Okay. Um, true, you, Chair. You, do you uh, have a follow up or is this a new question? It's a new question. I'll come back to you then, Councillor Bateman. <laughs> now I lost where I was. I'll let you go to Doug. I gotta... I'm going to go to Councillor Rowley, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to speak on uh, sidewalks for a couple of minutes, please. Um, once again, sidewalks in that whole development has been an issue or the completion of sidewalks. Um, some of the streets, I think, yet in phase one and two have not got sidewalks yet. So um, this might not be a deal breaker for me, however, but I would like to see this focused on a little bit more that sidewalks in phase one and two get completed. I'm thinking of um, maybe Tolman and Chris, Chrisman, there might be some more. And that um, that we that we take this serious this time, that we don't put the sidewalks on the back burner. They need to be there front top of mind as we move these kind of subdivisions forward. Certainly before assumption takes place. Correct. Um, I have another question, but I'll wait. I'll come back to you, Councillor LeBlanc. Yes. Um... Thank you, your chair. I would like to come to this creek that they're going to um, they're going to change its direction by almost uh, change it for direction of flow, move it over over 100 meters, close to 100 meters on, on to run the lane. Councilor Anderson and I attended a meeting at the Lower Trent a while back, quite a while back, when they were recommending to change this drainage, but they were going to keep it where it was. They were just going to take 
where we're building the seniors home and make it go to that creek. Now I see that the drainage, it, that's the drainage for that whole place because it doesn't just come from one place. They're gonna move it over and bring it to Rondo Lane to the east. So what's gonna happen with all the springs that come out of that, that farmland? So now if they don't have a natural way to drain and you've, you've put it in a, in a tank, in a, in a pipe, so where's it gonna drain on the surface or is it gonna to go to the, the homes that you're building into their basement? Because one of the questions I asked was the Hydro G study done seasonally for a flexible, for a flexible water table that's there. Because even when it's dry everywhere else, the center of that subdivision, the center of that, that, that farmland is wet. And it comes from springs off the hill and springs that come into that field. And so I just wanna understand what the, the water that comes from the springs, where it's gonna go. If you're just gonna take the surface water and rechannel it. Mr. Horm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, uh, to Councillor LeBlanc's question. Uh, so the currently right now, uh, we are aware of the springs. Um, as a summer student, I worked that farm uh, north of Highway 2. Uh, so well aware of the area and the drainage uh, in that area. So when that water does come down to Highway 2 right now, it crosses under the cross culvert. Um, our proposal will collect the water at that cross culvert and channel it within a storm sewer. So underground, um, conveyed to Rundle, down the west side of Rundle, to a naturalized channel. So work that was done previously with the Lower Trent and uh, the DFO um, was to gain approval to, to rechannel this uh, water course around the development and down into a natural channel which will enhance some of the fish protection down south of the tracks as well too. Um, you put it in a, in a pipe um, to protect drainage, um, but to answer uh, Councillor LeBlanc's question, the springs to the north, um, any water that's above and beyond uh, the culvert crossing capacity that's there currently now uh, will be conveyed overland flow. And through the detailed design, uh, we'll ensure that that overland flow can reach its ultimate outlet. Thank you. Is this a follow-up or a new yes. question? Go ahead. No, follow-up. But So since you're saying you're going to do a no through you, Chair, since you're doing, you're doing an overland flow between Rispin Drive and Wallen Drive, there's an overland flow there that's been done by this developer. And I've sent emails nine months ago to staff and to CAO that, that time that the stormwater catch basins were plugged because when they dug the basement, they filled them in. And then what they did, they went and sodded it. And just before I left for here, I took Councillor Bateman with me. And we went there because the sub pumps in these three homes continue on running. And I thought it was staff's problem, but it's the developer's problem. The catch basins are still plugged to the top with dirt nine months later. So now you're asking for my trust. I have a problem. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bateman. Uh, kind of a question comment is probably uh, most likely for the director because we've been talking about minimum requirements on different things. And if I go back to, I think it was Ms. Rundle that had mentioned it was a lot for her to digest and for her, I think she said mother-in-law. I think for anybody, what's the minimum standard for notice for a statutory meeting just for and is there circumstances where, where we can exceed that minimum notice to give, especially on these larger things like this, like, is there anything stopping us from going above the minimum, kind of like we're going above the minimum recommended in the building of it? Director? Uh, to, to the mayor, to, to council, Councillor Bateman in particular, uh, good question. Uh, the um, Staff asked for a, a public open house, who you recall receiving an information report that kicked off public engagement. And the, um, that was December 13th of last year. Uh, the following night, there was a public open house with materials for people to review in relation to the concept uh, of the plan, uh, first phase or the first concept rather. And uh, so really, in my view, there's a, a duty to, of the municipality to advise the public when there is substantive changes to a development so that the public can be so informed. So um, that's normally what's done if, if, uh, if additional 
um, consultations required. It, it should be in response to changing details. And in terms of more time, um, I think we have tonight received all these comments and we have a long list now and we'll have to be thorough in responding to them and then representing them to, to council at a later date. So that will, by default, add quite a bit of extra uh, engagement time. Thank you, Director. Councillor Rowley? Um, I just wanna go back to what Councillor uh, LeBlanc brought up earlier uh, regarding shifting the water course over to the pipe west of Rundle. What now happens to that floodplain that's, that's already there, right? It's been highlighted, it's marked as a floodplain. You're taking the water away, but you're still dealing with floodplain designation there, aren't you? Or does that, does that, is that eliminated then? And I, I would find that a little bit difficult that you would take, be able to, I'm, I'm not an engineer, so, but how do you take that totally away if you're gonna start building houses in an area that's already been um, kind of a water course for a while? Who wants to tackle that one? Mr. Orham? Thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, so we're relocating the water course and putting it into the storm sewer and directing it around. So it's no longer going through the developable area. That's correct. We're re-diverting re it, realigning it and taking it around the development. On the advice and permission of the Lower Trent Conservation Authority, correct? That's correct. Thank yes. you. Be good with that then. That's no longer a floodplain and they're N saying, okay. Nothing happens with things like that without the Lower Trent's tacit approval. Okay, thank you. We, we can't and they can't. Okay. Right? We've run just, into this before. Right. right. Just, just asking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, good question. Councillor LeBlanc. Yes, I have uh, just two questions. One, uh, just wait a minute, I get it back on my train of thought. Oh, on the floodplain. Just wait a minute. Oh, we have a bylaw, we passed it on accessibility. So when you look at the minimum, of this, they want to put the distance between the homes 1.2 meters. Uh, we went through this with other subdivisions for accessibility. They have to be 1.8 meters because it also allows for a sidewalk of 1.5 meters to allow accessibility to the backyard. So I have a, a thing when, if we, the council is going to pass a bylaw for accessibility of 1.8 and to have the sidewalk of 1.5, and now we're going to go and say, oh, no, you can do 1.2. What happens with the accessibility bylaw that we passed? That's question number one. That's for Mr. Welch. Do you, do you want an answer to question number one, or do you want to move on to question number two? I'll move to question number two. I, I already know the answer to that one. Oh, okay. Mr. Mr. Welch. That's fantastic. Uh, the director of, of, of planning. We have the sustainability committee that is looking for a project for looking for trees when the deputy mayor for trees i read it that they're going to tree run the lane on both sides but there's no trees inside the subdivision that's going to be built and would this be a project that the sustainable sustainability committee could be looking at because they have to do with the overall brighton the community of brighton and the change of the culture and everything that's what they're looking that's what it's for Thank you for that. So let's go back to question number one so that we can actually get an answer. And I, I think the answer has something to do with what we do on private lands versus what we do on municipal uh, properties, but um, Director Walsh. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor um, LeBlanc, uh, it was a good question. We didn't have that discussion when we updated our additional dwelling unit, zoning bylaw general provision and, and about the need to have interior side yards that would be wide enough for some accessibility. So. Um, as referenced in the staff report, we're having those uh, ongoing discussions and review of those site development standards. So uh, we'll keep that in mind uh, when you've made that, uh, that uh, observation. Um, on the second question, the, um, the matter of the trees, well, we will have a trees uh, requirement in the draft conditions. So the deputy mayor mentioned earlier about uh, needing to have a good uh, um, streetscape and in reference in the staff report is also uh, the direction to the proponent that there needs to be uh, that very thing as well. So in terms of the role of sustainability advisory working committee, 
uh, yeah, they might uh, they might have uh, uh, a role to play there. Um, right now, they're working to to get their uh, um, kind of a, a plan together to consult the public and make a, re a request to council to go to the public and look at what sustainability projects they might initiate, and then uh, it's staff recommendation to the committee at this point to come back with council with a project list for council's consideration and approval before commencing on those projects. So we make sure there's good coordination among those projects. Uh, whether that's one of them uh, is, uh, remains to be seen, but uh, it's a good question. Thank you, Director. Councilor Tadman. Thank you. Uh, I understand and I hope it'll be carried through that uh, all subdivisions will be coming before the accessibility committee for their preview. And back to what Councillor Blanc was saying, uh, I, I don't, I can't envision how a 1.2 would give enough um, width for a wheelchair chair or the, the motorized vehicles that a lot of people now are using. So um, that would be something I would certainly be wanting a draft. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions from members of council? Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Um, this definitely, I, I, well, I would think it would be a question for our planner. Um, I well understand phase three being on the uh, east side of Rundle Lane, and that sort of kind of completes that part of the subdivision. The name was changed now to Applewood. I'm wondering why this new whole development wouldn't have been a phase one of a new project. Um, when, when you spoke about um, overages as far as green space, of course, it would all be taken in as one. But if we were now again in a phase one, uh, there would be more requirements for things like green space, correct? So is this just kind of one building on another one? Is there a reason why we didn't go with phase four just being a phase one starting a new development? Director, do you want to tackle that? Uh, to the mayor, to Professor uh, Rowley, I, there was no particular reason why. It is a separate parcel. It is uh, distinctly uh, distinct ownership uh, because it's separated from phase three by virtue of Rundle Lane, a, a public road allowance. So uh, they aren't in the same parcel. They don't, uh, they don't abut, they're adjacent. But I think in the, in the view of the proponent, they're calling it a phase four because my understanding is the need to program their construction activities, particularly with grading and drainage and stormwater management and other issues and servicing down Rundle for both developments. So I think the intention is to develop a phase three component as well as the south end of phase four components. So they, they are kind of tied together when it comes to the actual construction programming. Um, but um, if I've missed something with that, then I'm happy to have the proponent uh, maybe speak to it directly if that's of council's interest. Ms. Wood. Thank you. And through you, uh, I think that's a, an accurate description. It's uh, more reflective of this is the same owners and developers' lands. It's natural continuation for them. They've sort of been planning streets uh, and the layout in anticipation of future phases of the development. But I think you have highlighted an important distinction, which is that this is a new uh, ap application for draft plan of subdivision, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment that need to stand on their own merits and are not uh, a continuation of previous draft plan approvals. Um, but from more of a practical construction point of view, it's a continuation of, of phases one and two. Could I, could I just Follow ask up. for yeah, a little bit of clarification? Because I'm thinking just specifically now of green space as mm -hmm. far as if once again, you're building phase four using what's left based on phase one, two, and three as far as green space. And you were mentioning that uh, the developer is well over what's required. But if this was a phase one, there would definitely have to be more specific green space allowed. And maybe there are some other uh, policies or requirements that a phase one would take into, which you can now just build off phase one, two, and three. Just a question. Thank you. I don't think we need an answer to that. I think, I think we'll just let uh, staff run with that particular ball. Thank you. Councillor LeBlanc. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I, I commend the planner when she uh, says that it's all one developer from phase one to phase four, because in the meeting in December, that's not what they were saying. But anyway, 
when it comes to green spaces, um, if there's sufficient green spaces there, why are the people all complaining and the people with kids still complaining? Are the green spaces there usable for the public or not usable for the dogs or for walking? Because the walking trails, I walked them that are there now on the, on the, uh, on the uh, stormwater management ponds and stuff, they are not walkable. They haven't been maintained. So, and I asked Mr. Miller, I'm on the train committee, who, made, who owns them? And he says, we do not own them. So if we own them, let's fix them. But if we don't own them and they're part of a trail system, why haven't they been maintained? For the public and the, and the, and the people that are there. And we need more space. These are, these are good questions, and I would anticipate you'd want to email Mr. Miller and the developer because they don't have anything to do with phase three or four that's before us tonight because they're existing trails in another part of the subdivision. But, 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 I get your but, question, but, Councillor LeBlanc. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I just think okay. they, don't, they don't belong here tonight. Okay. Okay. Anything else from members of council? Councillor Tadman. Maybe they don't belong here, but uh, if this is the same developer that did uh, phase one and two and is doing three next and then four, and we've had a lot of complaints about uh, unfinished business in the others, especially sidewalks, not knowing if we know the storm, whether we own the storm pond or not. I mean, I think, I think we should sit back and, and see if we can't at least insist that everything be up to the standards of the municipality before we make a decision. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments or questions from members of council? Council LeBlanc. Yes, for the phase four. Phase four, when I was part, I was part of the planning committee is part of the fringe. It's not part of the built up area, it's part of the fringe like the same as uh, other developers have. And they gotta, they gotta submit a whole new subdivision agreement to get into there. I, I, I don't mind, I like development. I like building the homes and bringing them, bringing more people and affordable housing. I'm all in for it. But the thing is, is it's on the fringe and I, I think it should be a new development. That's just personal, that's just me. The The question I have- Sorry, so Council I, LeBlanc, this, this is a new development and we're here tonight I, because it is a brand new subdivision agreement application. But so, only for, it, it's part of the 35 that was already pre-approved and they're tab tagging onto it. Uh, no, phase three and four are, are brand new subdivisions that are being offered to us this evening. Okay. All right, next question, go ahead. The thing is, to, today I received an email that I read uh, that saying there was no, um, uh, no communications from the residents of um, Orchard Gate. So I decided to call seven of them within the 100 meter area. I don't know if they're renters, they own the property, but I asked them if, what they did for their letter, if they received their letter, because two of them called me up. They wish they would have had a notice. So I called five more, they never got a notice, and they're within the 100, the 100 meter area. And not that they're opposed, they like the idea, but what they said to me, which I'll, I'll say what the resident said to me, they don't, they'd like to see this go forward, but fix what you already have before you take the next step. That's what they sold to me. That's what I'm saying. Fair comments. And I, I certainly hope that um, they're talking to our staff and to um, their, their developer and builder um, as they move things forward, because that's where yep. the responsibility lies at the end of the day. Yep. Any other questions from members of council comments? Go ahead, Councilor Ted. Just further to that, um, when you say talk to the developer and, uh, and it's, it's their problem, but at what point is it staff's problem if they're giving them the go ahead to go forward? So I think there's a lot of blame that runs around this different subdivisions, not just this one. Right. So, so just to answer that question, it's staff's problem when, when staff inspect the property and, and make a recommendation to council to either assume the subdivision or not. That's when it becomes the bailiwick of staff. Go ahead. And, and uh, we've had experience where... Um, we've been told that everything is tickety-boo. And uh, so we go ahead and say yes, because of, on, on staff's recommendation, and then we get hollered at by the residents because they haven't got a street light and there's no sidewalk and on and on it goes. 
not going to disagree. <laughs> Last question, Councillor LeBlanc. If this goes to vote, I'd like to have a recorded vote, please. This is the only the only decision tonight is to receive the report, and receive the information, and send it back to staff. Uh, and staff will bring forward a recommendation. May even if there's significant changes, we may even end up at another public open house. Um, but right now, we're just receiving all of this information that's being presented to us from council and the public. We're giving it back to staff and the and the developers agent so that they can make some decisions and decide whether or not to uh, bring forward a, I guess a complete application is, is the right term. I'll withdraw my, uh, my motion then, my, my for recorded vote on that. No, no need, it's still a good comment. Any other comments or questions? Uh, we did have someone chime in on Zoom, but I see they have left. So I'm gonna just carry on and I'll ask Ms. Woods, do you wish to make any final comments this evening? Uh, only to thank everyone for your feedback. Um, I've taken detailed notes and we'll be taking all of this back to our team and we'll be sure to work with staff to address all the questions and comments we received tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Director Walsh, do you have any final comments? Nothing further, Mayor. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by, I think that's Councillor Rowley, that the report of the Planning and Development Department dated May 9th, 2022, regarding plan of subdivision file number sub 202 official plan amendment file number OPA02-2021, zoning bylaw amendment file number Z13-2021, and consent application file number B19-2021 be received. And further that receiving public comments Pardon me, and further that after receiving public comments, a staff report be presented to council for consideration at a subsequent council session. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. We'll adjourn the statutory public meeting with a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council move out of the statutory public meeting May 9th, 2022 at 8.41 p.m. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. That brings us to planning and development reports. Our first report is with regard to amendment to application for site plan approval. ExploreNet Communications Incorporated, Concession 5, Part Lot 28, Part 1 on 39R, 11504, being 33 Grosjean Road. Um, and... Mrs. Deck, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Yes, um, just in further communications with Northumberland County on the site triangle requirements, uh, Northumberland County has requested an additional uh, six meters by six meters for a site triangle. Go ahead, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> it was mentioned in the report that it was um, uh, approximately nine meters by nine meters, but we received new information from the county that they were requesting an additional six meters by six meters. So uh, the second to last bullet point, we would amend to read six meters by six meters? An additional six meters by six meters. Over and above the nine by nine? No, no? Uh, there is currently a small site triangle there that we um, uh, looked at on the reference plan. So Northumberland County is asking for an additional six meters by six meters. So that second bullet point should read something like a site triangle at the intersection of County Road 41 and Grosjean Road achieving a safe sight line being an additional six meters by six meters. Would that work? Yes, you're correct. Uh, Councillor Tadman, I haven't read the motion yet, but you will be the mover. And Councillor Bateman, you are the seconder. So before I read the motion, I'll just ask, are you okay with that? Uh, Mayor, I don't know that we can go forward with that without uh, having consultation with both parties here. Because an extra nine meters is on top well, uh, of what they've asked. No, or originally it was nine. In the motion that you signed, it was nine by nine. Yeah. And now we're taking that out and we're saying achieving a safe sight line 
being an additional six meters by six meters. So, so it's, it's additional to the existing sight line rather than nine by nine, it's six by six. Mrs. Deck? Okay, I didn't understand what you were saying then. Yeah, so currently on uh, the parcel, there is a small sight triangle there right now. I don't know the approximate dimensions of that. Um, so nine meters by nine meters is a typical sight triangle in the rural area. However, um, in consultation with Northumberland County, they've reviewed that intersection and there are some sight line issues. So they are requesting an additional six meters by six meters in addition to what is currently there. I haven't read the motion yet, so I'm not entertaining any discussion. I just, those are your comments. So I'm going to, well, I was just looking for discussion around the motion itself, not around debating the motion. So um, are, you, are you still comfortable as the mover? N noting that that change has been made. So would you like me to remove your name from this motion? Yeah. Is there a mover? Councillor Bateman, are you still comfortable as the seconder? Uh, yes, because this just gets us to the part where we can ask more questions about this, correct? Right. Okay. So it's moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council receives a staff report regarding an amendment to application for site plan approval. File number SP01-2021 under the name of Explornet Communications Incorporated pertaining to part one on 39R11504. And the council amend the previously granted site plan approval under section 41 of the Planning Act to remove the requirements for conveying widening of road allowances and a site triangle in lieu of consideration of future conveyances. And further that council direct the site plan agreement to be amended to include the following clause. At a time of the municipality of Brighton's or County of Northumberland's request, the following land conveyances will be made to the municipal, pardon me, to the municipality slash county. A strip of land ensuring a minimum of 10 meters from the center line of Grosjean Road along the frontage of the property. A strip of land ensuring a minimum distance from the center line of County Road 41 along the frontage of the property if required. A site triangle at the intersection of County Road 41 and Grosjean Road achieving a safe site line being an additional six meters by six meters. And the municipality or county will be responsible for the costs of survey and legal services to bring into effect the land conveyances. I'll open the floor for discussion. Councilor Bateman. Uh, comment slash question. Uh, this is a tough one because I know it's taking land away, but at the same time, when I look at what this is for, and I have been a proponent of it, and it's more, not gonna change. We're, everybody is on board for improving rural broadband so and that's what this is all about but my question on this is when it was presented at the last meeting on the under the old numbers has the uh, property owner been spoken to that it's even taking more and what was his response to to that news mrs deck yes yeah, so we have made the agent um, aware we have had communications with the agent on behalf of the homeowner um, so they are aware of these uh, new recommendations. We are just leaving it at a time of the municipality or county's request. The only thing the municipality and the county will be asking for is that site triangle at this current time due to unobstructed site views and safe distances for, um, for vehicular traffic. So at the current moment, the municipality would only be asking for that site triangle and it would be up to the county at the time to request road widening. We would just wanna leave it open that in the future, Grosjean Road at this current moment in communications with the uh, manager of operations is not going to be expanded. Um, it was resurfaced in 2021, um, but there's no need for any future expansion at this time. We just do need to leave it open in any future instances. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And thank you for clarity, a site, site triangle, anyone who has a corner lot has to provide a site triangle. And that just means you're not giving it away. You're just providing, making sure there's no structure, no fence and that sort of thing, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I'm just still a little confused. You said additional six by six. 
and it says here nine meters by nine meters, and then you had additional. So then the word fifteen meters came out. So it's not it's not additional to nine by nine. It's additional to existing. So there is a currently a site triangle. They're, they, they being the county, I think, are asking for an additional six by six. And to the deputy mayor's point, we're not taking anybody's land. We're just asking to, for it to be cleared so that people can see around the corner. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tadman. So I, I did take my name off, but uh, as long as uh, the agent has spoken, spoken to the Groshaws, I'm, I'm quite happy to, if you want to call the vote. Director? Yeah, just some clarification there. The site triangle is an actual conveyance. It is. It is, yes. Thank you. So the, the ownership goes to? It would go to the county. Thank you. So that, that does change the dynamic, I think, a little bit. Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, the Chair. Uh, I'd just like to ask a, uh, a question to uh, the, the planner uh, or Samantha or Mrs. Deck. Um, when we were at that meeting, there was a little bit of a little bit of problem. I was getting a little sense of of something with with exploring that, and a lot of the residents want that tower because it'll give them better connection. But last week, uh, I don't know for what reason, uh, exploring it took all their equipment, their porta party. They did. They took everything off the site, and look, and they they just took off with it. So people were asking me, why did you leave? I didn't know. Are they still part of the game? Are they upset or is there something going on why they took all their equipment off the property? I seriously doubt anyone here can answer that question. Why ExploreNet would have taken their equipment off of a property. But I know that the, um, the agent for ExploreNet uh, is online. Mr. Ogilvie, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, three, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just, just two comments. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I realize this is not a, not a public meeting, and maybe not not our chance to make these comments. But uh, about the removal of equipment, I believe why they were on site now um, would have been for some soil testing and things like that. Um, so it's not because we're not fully approved yet. They can't actually build the tower. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why they may have had some equipment out there for testing and may have removed it for the time being. Uh, the plan is still to move forward with, uh, with this tower for sure. Um, I know this is a, this is a critical site for them. It would, um, it would service a close to 200 existing ExploreNet subscribers in the area, uh, who have, uh, who have service issues. Uh, it, uh, it as well has the potential to reach an additional 880, uh, uncabled dwellings. So those are residences without access to sort of traditional internet services, uh, in-ground uh, fiber services and things like that. Uh, but I would add, if this is the time, that, that this report has missed sort of one of our, our key issues uh, from, our, from our delegation last week. And, and what I thought maybe was one item that was meant to be included, uh, which is how provincial and therefore municipal planning controls are being exercised over a federal undertaking. And if they're not being exercised properly, why are we spending so much time debating these conditions that are being added um, with this tool? I think I'd get uh, Director Walsh to answer that question. Thank you, Mayor. As, as I recall at uh, our, our meeting last day on, on the second, that um, that was explained that the uh, federal, it does a federal jurisdiction, but they do in turn ask that uh, municipal consultation requirements uh, be made applicable and that our standards be made applicable. So um, if the feds wanted to overrule that, then they, they still could, but uh, they have deferred to the municipality. And in that case, that includes site plan control. Yes. Thank you. Anything further for members of council? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Next report is with regard to Bill 109, More Homes for Everyone Act 2022. Director Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? 
Uh, Mayor DeKels, one amendment there. Um, the recommendation is that site plan control delegation be given to the director of planning and development. And normally that is the, the, the standard across a lot of municipalities. Uh, recently, I've learned that uh, in some municipalities, they assign it to a technical review team. So I think it might be more appropriate if it doesn't go to necessarily uh, myself, but the, uh, a more team-based approach. And I would recommend that uh, when staff come forward with another follow-up report that, uh, that the delegation be considered to the development review team that we uh, have established and meet every other week. Do you, want, do you want the motion change or do you want it referred back to staff to bring back a report? Uh, at your pleasure, Mayor. Um, I think when the report comes back, it'll be recommended that uh, delegation be given to the development review team. That being said, um, I have a motion from Councillor Anderson and Councillor Bateman. Um, are you both okay referring this entirely back to staff and they'll bring back a, an appropriate staff report? Motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor, the way around, sorry. I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. That the report regarding, sorry, that the report regarding Bill 109 is referred to staff for review and to report back to Council. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion. Oh. Sorry, Councillor LeBlanc, did you have something to say? No, I was voting for. Oh, very well. Thank you. I put my right hand up and it doesn't show on the screen. I apologize. Man. <laughs> Our next report is uh, with regard to the draft community improvement plan. Director Walsh, we've read this report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, Mayor, there's lots, of, lots to be read there. <laughs> and uh, so I'll field any questions that there might be. And I might note that uh, we also have Mr. Brent Barnes here, who uh, was the chief author of it. Um, and um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. So he may be tag teaming me on any questions council might have. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a motion moved by Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor Tadman. The council received the staff report dated April 19th, 2022, regarding draft community improvement plan policies. And council directs staff to initiate public engagement through circulation to the municipal advisory committees of council, advertisements in the Brighton Independent, and posting on the municipal website regarding draft community improvement plans. And council directs staff to apply the 2022 budget assigned to a Brownfield CIP to also include CIP projects associated with affordable housing. And further that council consider budget allocation to a CIP program in 2023 to include programs described in the draft community development CIP program that are not otherwise budgeted. Is there any discussion? Council Rowley. Um, no questions, Mr. Walsh. Uh, as you know, I'm glad, I'm pleased to see that we're finally getting somewhere with, uh, with a program like this. It's, uh, it's been a long time getting here and I'm, I'm pleased that we're finally going to have some op options for for a lot of things in Brighton, particularly downtown. How long would you reckon we've been thinking about this? Mm, 12 to 15 years. I would say at least, yeah. So good that it's here. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, <laughs> Mr. Burns. Anything else from council? Go ahead, Councillor Tadman. Just the fact that it took me all afternoon to read it. So <laughs> I, I think I really know an awful lot about this whole <laughs> uh, community improvement plan and, uh, and I, Kudos to the author of that. Like, here, was, here. Yeah. Looks like it's covered everything. <laughs> and maybe a little more. <laughs> Anything for, we do. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. 
We have nothing listed under unfinished business, which brings us to bylaws, the first being consent zoning amendment B03-2022 and B04-2022, Z03-2022, um, Michael and Lori Van Harlem with a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw under the provisions of Section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, to amend bylaw number 140-2002, as otherwise amended, of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton as it applies to the lands located at 15617 County Road 2, described as part of Lot 27 and 28, Concession B, being Parts 1 on Registered Plan 38R 5049, except Part 1 on Registered Plan 39R 7578. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. That brings us to question period. Is there anyone in the gallery who has a question with regard to anything on tonight's agenda? Question period is an opportunity for members of the public to ask questions about items that appear on this evening's agenda. Members are asked to state their name for the record before asking their question. A maximum of five minutes is set aside for question period. Language, content, and conduct must remain respectful at all times. Questions will be received and answered by the mayor or by a member of council or staff if designated by the mayor. Mrs. Richardson. Thank you, Randy Richardson for the record. Um, with the possibility of 555 units, a thousand people, just out of curiosity, with all the other developments that are going on, um, will we be looking at an increased fire, ambulance, police? Are we regulated as to how many were by law, as to how many firemen, how many police we're supposed to have? By, by population, because we all know if there's a big, huge accident on the 401, we have no services in town because they're all on the 401. How does that work, Brian? Um, yeah, fire, firefighters uh, complement is regulated through our fire master plan and uh, is rolled out by the fire department through our budget um, and is looked at based on population. So I would expect that our fire chief would, would want to bring something forward at some point in the near future. What about the police? Like, are we, is that yeah. the same thing then? Like we would, yeah. are we, so, do, do you know, could, are we getting close that we're going to have to, I mean, we're getting a new bylaw officer because, you know, things are. Yeah, well, that, that was a municipal council decision. Yeah, I know. The OPP is not, uh, is paid for by us, but not. Uh, so it's the police and the fire chief that would come forward and say, okay, hey, like we're, we're um, like no, 500, just as like, like we're 500 yeah. people over short, we need to have two more police officers. So the, the, the OPP, that would be automatic. It would just happen as uh, through due course and we would get dinged for that on our, on our yeah, annual. Yeah. Um, with regard to ambulance, the, prov the province dictates a per capita and it's usually always about two years behind the actual growth um, and is uh, then provided by the county. The county runs the ambulance service County then pays for the upfront costs of additional ambulances and paramedics. And then the following year, the funding comes in from the province. So there's always a, a one year or two year lag. Uh, but yeah, it's same, same deal. It's, yeah. it's population based. Okay. Thank you for explaining. I was just curious how that, how that worked. Yeah. Thank and I, I do know the County is looking at Brighton and wants to be able to increase the level of service here from an ambulance point of view. And I would anticipate that will happen once we get a larger fire ambulance base built yeah I mean, anybody that lives south of the tracks i mean like the, the sirens have increased tremendously that, that we hear yeah okay thank you very thank much you. thanks anyone else in the gallery have a question or comment with regard to an item on tonight's agenda i see we've lost everyone on zoom so <laughs> i'm guessing no one from zoom world wants to join in <laughs> except doug of course i meant i meant from the public not from members of council uh, we do have a closed session meeting, so I will take a 10 minute recess before going into our closed session meeting. We will resume at 9.15 p.m. <sighs> Councillor LeBlanc, he'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> 